Welcome to CEH version 9. In this uh, video, we're reviewing chapter 5, scanning. So, chapter 4, we talked about footprinting. And so now we're moving into the actual scanning for uh, nodes. It's always kind of interesting because there's different types of scanning, and there's different rules for scanning. We could be scanning for devices, we could be scanning for ports, we could be scanning for vulnerabilities. So it kind of really depends. Uh, we can be scanning quietly, we could be scanning quite loudly. It just kind of depends on what tool we're using. Every individual type of scanning is about trying to find the pieces for an overall larger puzzle. Because again, if we're assuming that you don't know anything about the network, and we're using scanning to, to find everything, then we can slowly start getting a complete picture as we start going through the scanning process. So network scanning is a intensive and methodical process. We're trying to uncover the structure of a network, what uh, devices or end nodes are on it, and uh, what type of other information we can gather. For example, what address scheme are they using? What ports are they using? What MAC addresses uh, are there? What operating systems do they have? Things like that. All of them give us very specific information. What ports that are open or closed are being listed on? All of that helps us narrow down what devices are there, what vulnerabilities could be there, things of that nature. So a common thing is when I'm when I'm talking about scanning, well, people go ask, well, what really is that big of a deal? So we know the operating system. So we know what ports are there. What does that tell us? Well, it helps us narrow things down. By collecting information, we can start getting a more complete photo or complete map of their network. For example, if we know that they're running all Windows machines, well, we're not going to be running any Linux or Mac exploits on them. We know we're probably only going to be running Windows-based exploits on them. So, I mean, it gives us pieces of information that we can start using later down the line. So is the target up or down? Even if it's a simple ping, we just ping everything. Is the system responding to ping? Does the system respond at all? Uh, is it a ping? Is it an ARP request? I mean, there's different ways to do this. Basically, this just lets us know, are these machines on or off, or if they're even responding to ping? So what does a ping look like? A ping is just an ICMP packet, an Internet Control Message Protocol packet. Basically, it's an echo slash request. Are you there? And you respond. That's it. It's in every operating system. It's a very common network diagno diagnostics tool. And it, it works. The only reason it would not work is one of two reasons. Either it doesn't get there, or the host is not able to respond. Right, a third reason could be you disable the response to ping. So there's other types of IP scanners out there. They're used to perform different types of scans. So you can scan a range. You can scan a range and their ports. You can scan just their ports. You can uh, do a quick scan, which will be a, a faster scan for IP addresses. And you can actually save these to a file. So we've been mainly using nmap in our class, and nmap is fairly common. It's fairly flexible, it's very powerful, it's very easy, it's free, it's well documented, and again, depending on how you're, what you're doing with this, you can actually be pretty flexible with this. So we're talking about nmap. So why does the screenshot say zenmap? Well, nmap in Linux, and it's a command line tool. You don't really don't have this nice pretty shell. However, you can also have a graphical interface of nmap, which is typically zenmap. Zenmap is the graphical version of it. So port scan, what's the point of a port scan? Basically, we scan for ports. What ports are open on which hosts? That way we can kind of see, all right, maybe port 80 is open. Well, we can start targeting port 80. We're not going to use attacks that target different ports because we know 
port 80 is open, we're going to do a vulnerability that will allow us to exploit that port. Uh, this cell was a fun one. The TCP three-way handshake. So this is a process you have to become very familiar with. TCP is connection oriented, which means it will establish a connection and verify that each and every packet makes it to the destination. It does this through a three-way handshake. Basically a source will send a sync, the destination will send a sync ACK, and then the source will send a acknowledgement or an ACK. This three-way process verifies that we are going to be setting up end-to-end -end communication between our source and destination. Verifying that every time we send a packet, if it is not uh, gets delivered, or if there's a delay, the source will resend it. And we kind of change that up when we talk about UDP. UDP is connectionless oriented. It does not make connections. There is no guarantee. It's very low overhead because it doesn't resend packets. It's more of a best effort. I send it. Did you get it? Great. If you don't, oh well. TCP has several flags that we have to understand. So we have to understand the importance of these flags because if we're capturing packets, these are going to let us know lots of things. So we have an urgent pointer field significant, the URG. We have an acknowledgement. We have a push function, a reset the connection function, a synchronization sequence number, and a fin or finish, which basically means no more data from the sender. These allow us to be able to capture a packet, see if it's TCP, if it is TCP, review the appropriate flags, that we, we can understand kind of what they're doing. So let's look at this in the giant, giant scope. So we have our source and destination, or the initiator and the responder. So we'll send a sync, we'll get back a sync ACK, and then we'll send them a acknowledgement. Through a handshake, a completes handshakes, indicates specific open ports. Incomplete handshakes will be closed, typically. Scan gives the most accurate picture. The fun thing here is you can actually see some of the connections, whether they be open or closed within that. So this is for full connected scan. What about half scans? Things where you got a sync, a sync ACK, and a reset. So no final acknowledgement. The actual connection never fully completed. So we have some issues here. So the scan tends to be a little faster than a full connection scan. But this can give us at least some basic information. We have an Xmas scan which this basically allows us to scan with specific flags and ports. Some software developers do not implement TCP correctly, <laughs> so the way that they respond actually is slightly different. This does work on most modern day systems, but I mean, it doesn't always work. Again, it's an in-map scan. We have a fin scan, so we're, we're actually scanning with a specific flag fin and a specific port because again occurs when a packet is sent with the fin flag set use it to remember whether the ports are open or closed doesn't always function on newer targets and is typically blocked by a lot of firewalls so fin scans are kind of outdated but they, they still have their uses with older operating systems fragments here we have a few packets being captured. But you also start seeing the flags. In the info, we see that if we're looking at the sequence number and the acknowledgement number and their length, but you also see the, the two flags. So fragment breaks up packets. It is uh, reassembled by a target. Packets are fragmented when uh, they exceed the MTU size. So Common is 
1500 MTU, but sometimes it's 1490, 1492, sometimes 1512. So, I mean, MTU size can actually uh, break up packets. Packets are uh, fragmented. Normally, you can uh, fragment packets of a vulnerability or an exploit to help evade uh, being caught because if the packets are fragmented, it's, you don't see all of the packets, you only see a few of the packets. So, you're only getting a few pieces of the puzzle, so you don't know what the actual target is. Banner grabbing is always a fun one because banner grabbing lets you know what the server is, what the device is, what they're running, uh, its date, its time, if it's set correctly, things of that nature. The big part is it's used to identify both the system and the service. Is it a Cisco device? Is it a Windows device? Is it, is it a Linux device? That helps narrow down to well, what type of threat am I going to be doing? Uh, what type of vulnerability am I going to try to use? What type of threat can uh, it pose? Things like that. Vulnerability scanning or scanners is always a fun one. It's not normally stealthy, but we were using the mess that of the other day, and we were able to do Hail Marys. We threw a bunch of vulnerabilities at a target to see, well, which one would work. And it took a while, it made a lot of network traffic noise, but we got it to actually do several exploits. So, vulnerability scanners are used to identify known vulnerabilities against the target. It's not a good idea if we're trying to pretend to be a target, or we're sorry, if we're trying to simulate an attack on a target, because this could also target the device. It only catches already known vulnerabilities, so you have to keep that in mind. It's not looking for new ones, it's just looking for pre-existing ones. Proxies are a big thing. Many organizations are starting to use more and more proxies. It's a centralized device that funnels all traffic through it, and then that proxy then connects to the internet. Uh, you can use this to bypass uh, the school's web filtering, because if you're going to a blocked website through the proxy, well, you're not going to the adult site, you're using the proxy. The proxy is doing the adult website. So, I mean, there's some things with proxies you have to understand. A big thing also here with proxies, they can mimic you being in another country, you being in another location. So, uh, I've had friends that were in Germany, and they were a service member in the Air Force, and they wanted to buy a game that was only available uh, in the US. So what they did was they used the proxy to purchase the game because the proxy was in the United States. That way it looked like they were coming from the United States. Even though in reality the proxy server was in the US and they were in Germany. They were just funneling all their traffic through that proxy server. That's actually it for this chapter. I want to thank you.